Otherwise, I don't want to forget. That'd be a shame. There's a question. Will we have the review session on Wednesday, even though we have the quiz? Um, yeah, so there will be a review session, but it's a uh, final exam review session. Um, and so it will not be so quiz specific. Of course, there's going to be some overlap. Um, but you can notice already, actually, this is probably as good a time as any um, to show you the problems for Wednesday's class. So let me transition here to my notes really quick. Uh, and we have three problems to do today. They're kind of long problems and everything. And then here's the Wednesday stuff here. I've nicknamed it too many review questions. Uh, and you can see, I think it's something know, seven to 10 pages, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 pages. So it's 11 pages long. There's no way that we would ever possibly be able to do this, even though even if we went over uh, and stuff. So it is accurate in its name of too many review questions. Uh, and so I want to know which of these review questions are you most interested in seeing live? Uh, I'm happy to do, you know, basically we're going to try to put them into two different groups, things that we should talk about live here uh, and, you know, make a video about and all that sort of stuff. And then any of them that we don't get to, I'm happy to go ahead and just I'll, I'll write out the solutions and I'll post them, you know, with my, uh, the rest of the filled in class notes. And if there are any that we don't get to that you're amazingly interested in, right, and you need to, you know, actually talk about the answer and everything like this. Uh, then I'd be happy to cover that on Friday's class, right? So uh, Friday is going to be kind of an open forum review session uh, where Alec and I will take questions, really anything that you want to talk about. Um, so yeah, uh, you can choose, right? So I have this uh, little Google form. You can just uh, highlight this and put it into your browser, or you may even be able to click on it. Um, and then you can tell me which of these questions uh, pique your interest, which of them would you like to see kind of live in Wednesday's class. So yes, there will be a review session, but it won't be focused uh, on the quiz. It'll be focused on the course as a whole, going over the final exam. And I'll just add to that too, uh, for the quiz itself, uh, there is a sort of a review for the quiz that's also on the D2L page, right? And yes. so you can, you can look at that. I think if you pull it up right now, right, I'll show you where it is there. If you uh, do that, that's something where you could ask your TA about that in recitation tomorrow in your Zoom recitation. So take a look at that sort of practice uh, quiz. And, uh, and then if you have any, you know, the answers are at the bottom. If you have any questions about it, you can't figure out how to do one, maybe ask your TA about it tomorrow in recitation, the day before you have the quiz. Um, yeah. And then so these two. Oh, go ahead. So I was just going to say, um, it's not under the quiz seven folder. It's under supplementary material, just an FYI. Um, so yeah, under the supplementary material for that week, you can see quiz seven review problems. And like Alex said, the answers are at the bottom, but if you want to see full solutions, that's an excellent use of the recitation time with your TAs tomorrow or Piazza, uh, any of the above. I, th I think you also have a link to that just right on the homepage too, don't you? I thought, I thought that's where I saw it. You know, I probably do. I try to link these things in multiple places. Yeah, so here, yeah, right uh, here. review problems. Right, here, right on the homepage, yep. And so I sent that to my TAs, so they're, they're kind of ready for it. So if any of you do some of those problems, have any trouble with it, the TA should be ready to answer your question. And then to go with these last uh, two, these kind of go hand in hand here in the question and answer, what's the best way to study for the final? And then also, are there more practice uh, final exams besides the two posted? So definitely do those two that are posted. And then also um, there's one that's in web work too. If you go under the uh, open time sets, there's a web work practice exam. So that gives you sort of three practice finals that you can look at. And that is definitely a great way to practice. And then, you know, take your questions to your TAs or to the MLC or post them on Piazza or ask us on uh, Friday. Yep. Um, I agree with all of that. I would just say, yeah, the, the posted, you know, exams, uh, are in kind of the old style when we had final exams in person and everything. Um, and so I would also pay special attention to kind of all of the quizzes and of course exam two and things like this that we've had uh, that we coded into web work and just kind of see that there is this balance of previously existing web work problems, but also we've coded some of our own uh, and just that should give you a good idea of what the, the flavor is gonna be like or what the structure is gonna be like for the final. 
Okay. Oh, yeah, someone's noticing my background. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, well, with that, why don't we go ahead and uh, transition. Today we're talking about 10.4. It's the second class period where we're talking about this. Um, I'll just highlight, really, uh, there's a lot of the stuff in the videos, of course, we covered in the first class in 10.4. Uh, so things like the arc length and kind of the simpler version uh, of area, which is right up here. So that was really 10.4a. Here in 10.4b, we're going to be dealing with uh, all areas today. I'm going to nickname these less nice-ish areas. Uh, and they're going to primarily be using this one right here, kind of where we have to distinguish which curve is farther from the origin, which curve is closer to the origin, right? When do we have to do the subtraction and kind of uh, try to stress, right? When do we have to use this formula versus when do we have to use kind of this original formula where we just have one R? And sometimes I think the answer is surprising. So uh, that's kind of what we're going to be dealing with today. Um, I guess before we get into our questions uh, for today, are there any questions either from the video or things that we could spend maybe 90 seconds, two minutes on uh, before we get into this stuff? All right, well then, why don't we go ahead and get into our questions for today. So I'd like to find the area uh, for the region, sorry, uh, common to the neighbor, to the, oh, wow, reading's really tough today. Find the area of the region common to the regions bounded by r equals negative six cosine theta and r equals two minus two cosine theta. So, and I have this nice picture here, so that way uh, we don't have to spend too much time actually graphing these things, kind of the worst case scenario. Uh, would be that maybe you have to graph these things out and see what do the, uh, the region that they share in common uh, looks like. Uh, but this becomes a very long problem. So quite often, you know, maybe you'll see a couple of these for your learning sets uh, and whatnot and web work. But as far as time assessments goes, um, this would take a long time. Okay, so we need to try to figure out what is the area for this region that's shaded here, right? This is the region that kind of is in common for both the cardioid and the circle that we're presented with. Uh, and so kind of we look at this and see, well, maybe first thing uh, from last time, we talked about this idea of symmetry. So that, right, this thing is symmetric. And so we could think about, maybe we could just find the area of this top piece right here and then double it, right? Because of how symmetric this is. And so that's my first idea is that we can use symmetry and that'll make our lives a little bit easy. Um, and so remember, we have this formula for area, which is gonna be, integrating up some theta values, right? So this is integrals with respect to theta. Uh, and so we need to know what is our bounds for theta. And kind of this is a, a difficult question. So first of all, I see that as we're looking over here at like maybe uh, theta equals zero, this doesn't intersect the region at all. And then kind of as we increase, again, we're not really intersecting this region. So remember theta is telling you which direction do you look at. And then these R's are kind of taking steps outward from the origin. And it's only once we get to maybe pi over two, so when we're looking straight up, or maybe just a little bit beyond that, that we actually start hitting our region whatsoever, right? Now we can see that we're actually going through our region. And so as soon as you take the, you know, the slightest angle beyond pi over two, you can see that we're actually coming into contact with our region. And so therefore, the lower bound for this is going to be pi over two. Uh, and then our upper bound, right? So we continue to intersect this region. And if we're just talking about, and we're using the symmetry and everything, you would keep on going until you hit pi, right? Because when you're looking at this angle pi, that's kind of when you, the region stops after that, right? Uh, we could set it up, you know, as if we were not using symmetry and then you'd want to include that bottom half there. But I want to just figure out the area of that green region. And so down here, right, there is that, it doesn't exist, we're gonna use the symmetry. And so our upper bound is going to be pi. And now we need to think about how do we enter the region and how do we exit the region? So like, let me fill in a few more things here. So uh, we are gonna be doubling this, right? To take account uh, that symmetry. Uh, and then we know we need this whole one half and the kind of 
bigger function. So one half, maybe something like f of theta squared, I think is how the uh, video notes does it. And then one half, maybe g of theta squared. So again, we need kind of a, a bigger function and we need a smaller function. How do we enter into this region and how do we exit this region? And so uh, it's very tempting because we have two of these things right here, right? To say, okay, one of them has to be f and one of them has to be g. Uh, but sadly, that doesn't always have to be the case, right? So let's talk about this and kind of break it down uh, a little bit closer here. So let's talk about when I'm just a little bit bigger than pi over two. So maybe I'm looking at these two arrows right here. I'm looking pretty darn close to straight up. And again, I want to talk about how do I enter into my region and how do I exit my region, right? So again, this green area right here is my region. Let me kind of erase a few of these, kind of clean this up a little bit. Okay, well, I noticed that kind of as soon as I take the tiniest step off of the origin, I am in my region, right? I'm in this green shaded area. And I exit the region through this red curve right here, this thing that's the circle, uh, which by the way, that's the minus six uh, cosine theta. So this red curve right here is the R equals negative six cosine of theta. So I seem to enter as soon as I take the tiniest step off of the origin, and I seem to exit as soon as I hit this red curve, this negative six cosine of theta. So notice that this cardioid isn't being used at all. If I try to get the cardioid involved, right, the cardioid's equation, this two minus two, what was it, sine or cosine, two minus two cosine of theta here, that's all the way out here. That's these points right here. Notice that those aren't a part of the shaded region. So I'm sorry, I'm waiting for my iPad to catch up a little bit. So yeah, those points out there aren't actually a part currently of that shaded region. So we're not actually using the cardioid at all at this point. Notice a little bit later though, kind of if I was to look a little bit farther down, so maybe again, different theta value and we're kind of a radius is coming outward from the origin. Notice we no longer go until we hit the circle out here, that red curve, this negative six cosine of theta, but we actually stop as soon as we hit the cardioid. And look, this trend seems to continue over here, for instance, as well. So we stop once we hit the cardioid. We don't even care that, I mean, if you go farther, you hit the circle, because that's not kind of the, the restriction here, right? We need to be inside both of them. And so right now, the cardioid is being more restrictive than the circle. And so we're very interested in when does it stop, not so much when does the circle stop. And so we become very interested, okay, well, when do you make this transition, right? At the beginning, we're talking about the circle. And later on, we're talking about the cardioid. And at a certain point, they seem to make this transition. And of course, that's going to be where they intersect. Notice that before this, you're very interested in how do you leave the region? by exiting the circle, this red curve. And then after that, you leave the region by going through the cardioid. It's more restrictive. It's closer to the origin. Notice in both of these cases, the way that you enter in through the or, sorry, into the region is just immediately, right? As soon as you take the tiniest step off of the origin, you are in the region. And so that's uh, suggesting that we need to actually break this up based on when do they uh, make the switch here. So let me go ahead. I would like to break this up uh, and we can go ahead and cancel out, right? These twos and the one halves will nicely cancel out. And I would like to talk about for a while at the beginning, uh, so sorry, at pi over two and beyond for a little while, right? We enter in the smaller curve that we actually enter in through is just the origin. It's r equals zero. So this is technically zero squared here. The larger curve, the thing that we exit through is the circle. So that's, again, we're talking about at pi over two and a little bit beyond before we get to that uh, transition point there, that point of intersection. Uh, and so let's see, this uh, circle curve is going to be this negative six cosine of theta quantity squared with respect to theta. And then for a while after that, we need to talk about right? Uh, after we've made this transition, and now we care about the cardioid quite a lot, right? So we'll figure out what this is supposed to be here in a minute. 
right? All the way up to pi. We said that pi, we exit that green region. We no longer, uh, you know, are in this region. So, so from some value to pi, we seem to, again, enter in immediately uh, on the origin, right? As soon as we take the tiniest step off, right, we're already inside of this region. And then we exit through the cardioid. So again, we were looking at all of these intersection points right here. They all seem to be exiting through the cardioid. And so the cardioid has the equation two minus two cosine of theta. And we need to take that and we need to square it. So this is essentially the setup. Uh, the only thing that we have to figure out is this transition point, right? How do I know when I transition uh, from caring about the circle to caring about the cardioid? And so we need to set up and figure out when do they intersect. And so we can just take their equations here, set them equal to each other and solve for that theta value. So I'm going to have negative six cosine of theta is equal to two minus two cosine of theta. We can go ahead and do a bit of rearranging here. Uh, if I add two cosine of theta onto both sides, I get negative four cosine of theta over here. I can divide by negative four and I can get negative one half. And I need to figure out, well, when does cosine of theta equal negative one half? And so we think back to our unit circle days, and this is going to be at two pi over three. And in fact, it even kind of looks like it, right? So this intersection point at two pi over three, that seems completely reasonable to me. This seems like about 30 degrees beyond uh, that 90 degrees, that pi over two. And so, yeah, that seems reasonable. Okay, so this is when we make this transition. So we're going to be going from pi over two up to pi, sorry, two pi over three. That's when we're going to be exiting through the circle. Uh, and then from two pi over three up to pi, we seem to be exiting through the cardioid. And so uh, already you can see that these are probably living up to their names of, you know, less nice-ish area problems, right? So this is uh, getting more complicated now. Um, at this point right here, right, this I, I think is a reasonable thing um, it's you know, possible for quizzes, for exams, for times, you know, things where you have to set up uh, the integral that represents the area. So going through this process, uh, and this was, again, kind of quite conceptual, uh, but going through this process and figuring out what integral should be actually set up, um, I think that this is completely reasonable for a timed assignment. Of course, for the learning sets and things like this, uh, I mean, we'll see this problem all the way through by all means, um, but this will take, uh, you know, another couple minutes to go through and actually evaluate all this. So I guess maybe at this point, before we do the evaluation, are there any questions? Or let me also, uh, while you're typing and asking any questions that you might have about this, uh, let me uh, kick it over to Alec as well and just ask, are there things that you would add to this or, or things that I missed that we should bring up? Sure. Uh, so first of all, I think the, the um, explanation is great. They, uh, somebody asked, where did the zero come from in the area formula? And, and that's really representing your sort of G of theta. Um, you know, sometimes we'll have something maybe like a circle inside of a circle. Or there's maybe a crescent shape where the region doesn't actually touch the origin. And so you sort of have to take like a larger curve and then subtract a smaller curve to get something in between. In this case, it all goes right down. Every part of this goes back and touches the origin. So that's essentially your inner curve is just really just the point at zero where the, where the radius is zero. Yeah, and let me uh, add to that just by saying this last one here that we'll be dealing with today, we can see that if for instance, we're looking in this direction uh, and this one, I, I think, uh, let me double check. It's, yeah, so inside the cardioid and outside of the circle. So um, we're going to be trying to figure out this region right here. This is the only one that I didn't shade. So we want to know what is the area of this region right here. Just like you were saying, Alec, uh, for this one, there is an actual curve that you enter the region through. And in, at least at this angle right here, we seem to be uh, entering in through this inner circle thing. Uh, and then we seem to exit the region through this outer cardioid. Uh, so this is also uh, very much a possibility. Perfect. And, and then another question just came in and said, so on timed assessments such as quizzes and exams, the graphs will be given to us. Uh, often they are. I'll tell you something that's fairly common here. If you, if you look at this problem, we essentially have three things going on. One is that we're trying to find the intersection point between the two curves, which you see down there below the graph. Sometimes that's asked on its own. Like for example, on the web work you're about to do, the first few questions just ask you for that. 
So sometimes they'll give you something like that, maybe without the graph and ask you to find the intersection points. Then other times they'll, uh, they'll give you the graphs and ask you to set up. Um, and then sometimes they'll give you a problem and just maybe ask you to do the graph, but we tend to not put all of those together. The problem is if you graph something wrong, then the calculus is going to be wrong afterward. So lately we've been sort of splitting them up. Maybe one problem we ask you to do a graph, then give you a different problem. We already have the graph and ask you to do the calculus part on it. Yeah, that's more typical. Yeah, and um, I would say that uh, also you'll, you'll see when we do this calculation, that we have a bit of uh, chapter seven stuff, right? When we actually go to integrate this, we need to use some of our techniques from chapter seven. And so it's uh, maybe less likely, you know, on the quiz even uh, to see these things all the way through because we do need to uh, hit our ch chapter seven stuff. But maybe on the final exam, you're more apt to see one of, uh, you know, again, maybe the setup's given for you or something like this and you want to actually evaluate it out. Uh, so I think that would be a more, reasonable final exam question just because we're interested in testing your chapter seven knowledge as well uh, for the final. Um, okay, so without further ado, why don't we go ahead and do this one. So we're going to be integrating from pi over two to two pi over three. This is going to be 36 cosine squared of theta uh, integrating with respect to theta. So just simplifying the fact that we're uh, squaring things, um, zero squared plus zero, so that's not such a big deal. And then we need to go ahead, uh, I'm worried I don't have quite enough room. I'm gonna start a new small line here. Uh, two pi over three to pi. And remember, we need to foil this all out. The first, the inners, the outers, the lasts. And so again, if you're going too quick, you'll probably just write down four plus four cosine squared theta. And that's the firsts and the lasts. But don't forget, we also need the inners and the outers when we're evaluating out a binomial squared. Uh, and so altogether, we should get what this minus eight cosine of theta. So this is sometimes a common mistake that uh, I see anyway. And uh, well, from this, right, I think that evaluating out the integral of four is quite straightforward. Evaluating out the integral of cosine is quite straightforward. But remember, I alluded to that we needed some of our chapter seven knowledge. And so that's going to come down to integrating cosine squared. So remember 7.2, we talked about how can we integrate uh, powers of sine and cosine. Uh, we also did secant and tangent and things like this. And when you have these even powers of sine uh, and of cosine, we need to use the power reduction rule. So the power reduction rule says that cosine squared of some value u is going to be equal to one half times one plus cosine of two u. And so this is what we're going to need to go ahead and exchange with here. So k pi over two, oops, to two pi over three, 36. And I'm gonna replace this with one half, one plus cosine. In this case, my u is just theta. They happen to be the exact same, so this is gonna be two theta. Uh, and then here, we're gonna do the integral from two pi over three to pi. Uh, let's group the easier stuff together, the four and the minus eight cosine of theta. And then here's where we need to use this power reduction rule. So instead of cosine squared, I'm gonna write one half, one plus cosine of two u. Again, u is just theta in this case, so two theta. Integrating with respect to theta. So we can see that there's gonna be a bit of canceling that happens here. We can just do a, a two there. Here, I guess we could do an 18. And now we're ready to go ahead and integrate. Uh, so when I integrate this, well, I guess the, the 18 we could pull out when I integrate one, I'm gonna have uh, theta, because we're integrating with respect to theta. When I integrate the cosine of two theta, we're gonna get one half sine of two theta. So remember, this is a small u substitution. That's why you need this one half right here. And double check, if I take the derivative of this, I do get back to where I started because of the chain rule. Now we need to evaluate from pi over two to two pi over three. Uh, for this one, uh, it doesn't look like there's any one value. Well, I guess I could bring out a two across the board, but I think that's going to make it more painful than it's worth probably. So let me just go ahead and integrate. Here we're going to get four theta minus eight sine theta when we integrate that. Um, when I distribute this two, right, I need to integrate a two. So this is going to become two theta. And when I distribute it to here, I think this is just going to be sine of two theta. 
right? Because kind of the two's along for the ride, but then when you integrate, you get a half, so those would cancel. So double check, if I take the derivative of this, do I get two cosine of two theta? And the answer is yes. So that is the correct antiderivative. And then we need to evaluate from two pi over three to pi. So now all of the calculus is done. Let's go ahead and finish up with the algebra though, right, actually plugging these things in. And so let's see, uh, I'm gonna get evaluate kind of term by term here. Uh, so if I plug in 2 pi over 3 into theta, of course, it's just going to be 2 pi over 3. If I plug in the pi over 2 into theta, uh, well, it's just going to, of course, be pi over 2. Now let's go ahead and do the sine stuff. So let's see, this is going to be sine of, and I need to multiply by 2. So this is going to be 4 pi over 3. So 4 pi over 3, let me draw a mini unit circle here. 1 pi over 3, 2 pi over 3, 3 pi over 3. 4 pi over 3 down here, that's going to be the negative root 3 over 2. And then we're going to go ahead and subtract away. If I plugged in pi over 2, and remember I need to double this, so I'm really plugging in pi into sine, well, sine of pi is just 0. So that's the first bit. Uh, for the second bit here, I'm tempted, I see we have a couple of like terms. So maybe before I actually evaluate this, let's just rewrite this and I'm gonna make this six theta. So again, just as before, I'm gonna do this term by term. So I'm gonna plug in the pi and the two pi over three first into the six theta. So this is gonna be six pi minus six uh, two pi over threes. So that's all of my theta work there. Now I need to plug in to sine. I need to plug in pi, so that's gonna be zero. And I need to subtract away when I plug in two pi over three. Uh, so 2 pi over 3 is up here, uh, so the y value on the unit circle, that's going to be positive root 3 over 2. And then finally, uh, I need to plug in things into sine of 2 theta. So when I plug in pi, I'd have sine of 2 pi, that's also going to be 0 here. Uh, and then I need to subtract away when I plug in 2 pi over 3, but remember we're doubling that, so it's going to be 4 pi over 3. And so sine of 4 pi over 3 is again back down here. Uh, that's going to be that negative root 3 over 2. So minus a negative root 3 over 2. Uh, and there we go. So now we have everything, uh, I guess, plugged in. Um, I did this problem earlier, and maybe this is probably a good spot to stop. Uh, but when I simplified this down all earlier, I got 5 pi. So if you would do this out for me and see if you also get to five pi, that'd be a great confirmation. I'll check this over one last time, you know, maybe before I post the uh, filled in class notes later today and just verify that this all simplifies down. But now we're really, you know, significantly beyond the calculus bit. And we're just really into arithmetic and, you know, simplifying things. All right, so that is the evaluation for this one. Questions. Or anything that you'd like to add, Alec? I don't have anything to add. I was kind of trying to follow your work along. I didn't see any obvious mistakes, so I think you're good there. Um, we did just get a question and just said, will we have questions this long on the final? No. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the focus on this is probably not correct, right? I mean, the, we had to evaluate out the cosine squared twice and all that sort of stuff, really. If we were interested in can you evaluate out the integral of cosine squared, really only need to test that once. So yeah, and again, these tend to just be broken down in pieces. It's very possible that every part of this could appear in the final, but maybe you'd have one problem where it asks you to find the intersection of two curves, maybe one where it asks you to sketch a graph, maybe another where it gives a graph and asks you to set up but do not evaluate an integral, and maybe a problem where you have to do a, an integration that's like a part of this at the end. They tend to be broken into pieces. Okay, so then uh, why don't we go ahead and continue? I have another one here for us. Again, on the uh, less nice side of things, find the area of the region common to the regions bounded by four sine of two theta and r is equal to two. So it looks like there's quite a few pieces. Uh, I don't have this one exactly shaded, right? But the region that's common to both of them is actually gonna be four pieces. So there's this piece that's common to both. There's this piece. And then, of course, the two on the bottom here as well. So we want to find this total. 
And so, uh, of course, right, with all of the symmetry that we see here, um, as you can probably guess, that if we can figure out the area of just one of these green pieces, and so maybe I'll go ahead and focus on the one that's in this first quadrant here. I'll just highlight this a few extra times, say that this is the one that we're going to be focusing on. If we could figure out the area of this, well, we could simply just multiply it by four, and that would give us the area overall. So we're going to be interested in just figuring out the area in this first region, and then we're going to multiply it by four. So we're going to multiply this by four in order to get the overall area for the region that's in common to these two curves. Okay, well, uh, as I said that this is in the first quadrant. So you can imagine that all of our theta values, right, are going to range between zero and pi over two. Those are all the ones that are in the first quadrant here. So we're going to have zero to pi over two should be maybe a good place to start. But again, we kind of have to think about how do we exit the region? What is our f of theta? And how do we enter the region? Oops, almost forgot the one half there. And how do we enter the region? And so this one's a little bit tough to see. You have to be careful with this one. But notice that if I was to first start off, I'll use purple. Um, just a little bit bigger than zero. So maybe something like this, a little bit bigger than zero. Uh, so again, as soon as we take the tiniest step off of the origin, we are in the region, right? So the origin seems to be how we're entering into this curve. And then the more restrictive function at this point seems to be this four leaf clover thing, right? That seems to be how we're actually exiting this green region here. We don't really care about the circle at this point, right? Sure, it's a little bit farther on. There it is. Uh, but again, the more restrictive thing is actually this four-leaf clover. As we continue a little bit farther, however, so if I was looking at maybe in the direction of theta equals pi over four, we can see that uh, now we seem to be exiting through the circle, r equals two. Uh, and even though the four-leaf clover does you know, come up eventually, it's less restrictive, right? And so actually the part that's uh, you know, in common with this um, you know, ends after r equals two. And again, we seem to be in the region immediately after r equals zero, right? So it seems like the origin is gonna be playing an important role here. Um, and then we continue a little bit farther still. And once we get close enough to pi over two, so 90 degrees, again, we can see that we no longer care about the circle any longer, that this is actually farther out. Um, but the way that we exit this region, this green uh, region that's in common to both of them, is actually through this four-leaf clover thing again. And so just as before, we become very interested in when do we transition between caring about the four-leaf clover, right? So in this region right here, we seem to care about the four-leaf clover. And then for a while here, we care about the circle. And then for a while longer, right, we care about the four leaf clover again. So we become very interested in what those theta values are. Notice in all three of these regions, we seem to enter in through r equals zero, and it's just how we're exiting that seems to be changing. And as I already alluded to uh, for our third problem, right, that'll be changing yet again to show you that this doesn't always happen. Um, right? Sometimes you enter in through a more interesting curve than just r equals zero. So we'll be dealing with that here uh, shortly. So, okay, let's go ahead and first maybe solve, right? Uh, when do these intersections actually occur? So I'm going to set up, right, four sine of two theta is equal to two, right? So that's my two equations, my r equals two and my r equals four sine of two theta. And we want to know when do they intersect? And so we could go ahead and rearrange. And we're going to get, well, we're interested when sine of two theta is equal to a half. And the way that I always solve these things, whenever I have something more complicated inside of sine or cosine, or really even tangent or things like this, I always do a mini u substitution, right? And I first solve for u. So I'm going to try u is equal to two theta. Uh, I'm not going to use any calculus or anything with this um, here. I'm not taking derivatives or anything like this. Uh, but I also find that this is a very useful technique uh, in algebra and trig. 
So now I want to figure out what u satisfies uh, sine of u equaling one half. And so you may remember, um, right, things like uh, pi over six or five pi over six will work. And of course, if we continue along the unit circle even more, uh, we'll see that there are lots of, there are in fact infinite values that work uh, for this. Uh, but it turns out these are, you know, in the first iteration, the first round of the unit circle, that these will be all we need in order to solve our particular problem. Okay, so if u is equal to two theta, and my end game, my end goal here is really to solve what does theta equal, well, now you can see it's very easy. We just need to divide everything by two, right? So this is going to be pi over 12, and this is going to be 5 pi over 12, which incidentally, right, this is less than uh, 6 pi over 12, or that's the same thing as pi over 2, right? So both of these, pi over 12 and 5 pi over 12, live in that first quadrant. They're larger than 0, so you can imagine this one's probably going to be pi over 12 here and less than pi over 2, so 90 degrees, so this one's going to be the 5 pi over 12. So these seems like completely reasonable answers. And if you were to uh, continue and write and do another iteration of the unit circle, right, you could figure out, you know, where these two intersections are, and these two, and these two. Uh, but this is one nice thing. By using the symmetry, by restricting our view to just the first quadrant, uh, things are working out quite nicely. Okay, so now let's go ahead and set up the integral. So again, we can see there's going to be a bit of canceling that happens. And maybe this just goes to 2. And we can get the area is going to be equal to 2 times. And we need to talk about the part where we enter in through 0 and we exit through the 4-leaf clover. So that's going to be from 0 to pi over 12. Um, and again, we exit through the 4-leaf clover for sine of 2 theta. And we enter in through the origin, 0. And let's not forget, we have to square these things. Next up, we have the region uh, where we care about exiting through the circle, right? So this is going to be from pi over 12 to 5 pi over 12. And in this case, again, we seem to be entering through the origin, and we seem to be exiting through the circle. And that's just 2, r equals 2. And then finally, in the last bit, and this is a... Uh, Part where, well, we can see that maybe if we know what this area is here, um, I'll go ahead and shade this in, I'll just shade it in black here. This is going to be, again, using even more symmetry. If we know what this area is here, maybe we don't need to do the calculation to figure out this area here, right? Again, with symmetry and the fact that uh, this is symmetric along the line y equals x, maybe if we can just figure out what one of these is, uh, we can just double it, and that'll give us the full-on area for both. And so maybe let's go ahead, uh, and I'll write it down here. So from 5 pi over 12 to pi over 2. But then I'm just going to, in the next line, uh, forget about this, and I'm just going to double this one up here. I think that would be a reasonable way to go. So before we get into the evaluation bit, and let me maybe move this over just to give myself a little bit more room. So no longer focusing on that. Let's say we're going to do the area of, and I'm going to make this 4 times the integral from 0 to pi over 12 of 16 sine squared of 2 theta d theta. And then 2 times the integral from pi over 12 to 5 pi uh, over 12. These are not the most beautiful symbols I've ever written. 5 pi, there we go. It's a little bit better. Uh, and here we're traveling through the circle. 2 squared would be 4. So this right here is what I want to evaluate out. So again, I think this is maybe a good place to pause and see if there are any questions out there. Um, we're now complete with the setup part. Uh, again, we'll do the evaluation, but that's kind of a, a different skill. So questions or things that I'm forgetting or should definitely bring up, Alec? I think you covered it pretty well. I mean, certainly you could do this longer method as well. 
Um, oh, oh, here's a question that just says, yeah, why is that? And I think he was just about to explain this. Why is there that third integral? Um, that's just that, that last part when you switch back from the circle back to the four leaf clover. But instead, since those two black regions are the same, he's just doubling the first one, knowing it's the same as the third one. Yeah, whenever you, there's the symmetry, utilizing that symmetry is a good way to save some time. And so this has a lot of symmetry. It's symmetric about the x-axis, the y-axis, and this line y equals x. And so that the question that says, why is there that third integral? Well, if you didn't have that third integral in the first place in the setup, then that, that sort of upper purple region there, you, you wouldn't be counting for that area. You would just sort of have that the kind of rounded part at the bottom along with the sort of pizza slice shaped thing in green and you wouldn't have that last part where they, you've got that curved edge again. Yeah, exactly. If I can demonstrate maybe on this one here, um, basically if you didn't include the last integral, you'd basically be figuring out the area maybe of something that looks sort of like this rotated into the uh, first quadrant. So it just kind of abruptly stop. Something like that. So it wouldn't include all of the uh, shaded region that we're looking for. Uh, excellent. Anything else? Okay. Well, um, of course, this second integral I'm excited for, right? That should be fairly straightforward. Uh, this first integral. This is something where we have right uh, sine squared, and so we need to jump back to our 7.2 knowledge. Again, just like we have a power reduction rule for cosine, we also have one for sine, uh, and this is available on our formula sheet. So it says that sine squared u is equal to one, uh, oops, sorry, I forgot the one half, one half, uh, one minus cosine of two u, something like this. And so let's go ahead and apply this. And let's see, I'll leave it just like this for the time being. Zero to pi over 12, 16, we have the one half. We have one minus cosine of two theta d theta. And then this one we're gonna represent as uh, what from pi over 12 to five pi over 12 of eight d theta. Um, and Okay, we could simplify, right, the, the 1 half and the 16, those cancel, and we're going to get 8. Um, but I have made a mistake, and I want you to tell me uh, what mistake did I make, right? Uh, what was my the, the wrongdoing that I did here? Uh, yes, I see it already. Uh, it should be 4 theta, right? So when we make this transition from sine squared of 2 theta and using this uh, power reduction rule here, notice that whatever we have inside of the sine, whatever that u is, that sorry, inside of the sine squared, whatever that u is, we have to double it, right, when we make this transition. So it shouldn't be 2 theta. We need to, to double it and make it 4 theta. But this is, again, kind of a, a common mistake uh, that I often see. All right, so with that, uh, why don't we go ahead and solve these out? So four and eight make 32 when we multiply them together. When I integrate one, we get theta. When we integrate, uh, let's see, cosine, we're gonna get sine of four theta. And don't forget, really, there's like a small u substitution. Uh, so we need a one fourth. And you can, of course, double check. If we take the derivative, we should get back to where we started. This is gonna be from zero to pi over 12. And then here, when we integrate 8, we get 8 theta. And for this one, we need to evaluate out from pi over 12 to 5 pi over 12. And so, OK, let's go ahead and start plugging things in. So this is going to be 32. And if I just, uh, again, I'm going to do this term by term. So if I plug in for the theta, um, let's see, pi over 12 and minus 0. OK, so that's uh, rather boring there. Um, when I plug in for the sine, let me bring up the 1 fourth right here. So let's say I need to multiply by uh, 4. So this is going to be really, when I plug in the pi over 12 and I multiply that by 4, this is going to be sine of pi over 3. So sine of pi over 3, that's going to be this root 3 over 2. 
And then I need to subtract away when I plug in zero. Well, when you multiply zero by four, it's still zero. So sine of zero, zero. All right, so that's the first uh, integral there. And then we have this eight. And when I plug in for theta, we have five pi over 12. These ones are quite nice. And minus one pi over 12, just a pi over 12 there. Um, and so let's see, things are gonna cancel out a fair amount. Uh, so let's see, we could take, um, we need to distribute this to each piece. I'm thinking about how like four will, uh, if we take four from this 32, it'll be quite nice. Uh, we can cancel it with a 12 quite a bit. And let's see, so we're gonna have eight pi over three remaining there. If we take four and cancel with this four here, again, we're gonna have eight. So we're gonna have what's minus eight root three over two. And we can see this cancels even more. So maybe a, a four root three there. And then we need to add on, we're gonna have eight and five pi over 12 minus a pi over 12 is going to be, uh, let's see, four pi over 12, or that's gonna be the same thing as, uh, well, pi over three. And so let's see, we have a couple of these eight pi over threes. So this is going to be 16 pi over three and then minus four root three. Hmm. See, I don't, I like the four pi over three, but earlier when I did this, I got a different answer. Why did I get a different answer? Or did I just make a mistake earlier? So let me double check this right here because this is where I'm differing. Eight and four pi over 12. So eight and four pi over three. No, I think I made a mistake earlier. I'm liking this more now. Yep. So I just made a mistake earlier. I'm happier with this. Did you catch any other mistakes? Or, or well, I guess I didn't make a mistake here. I just made one earlier. Did you catch any mistakes, Alec? No, I, uh, I was about to jump in earlier when you forgot to double up that thing, but then I think you did that on purpose. And, uh, yep. and then the question uh, just came in here, said, sorry, which are we doubling to get both edge, edges, the sine squared or the, mm -hmm. and again, that's back to the, you're, you've got to double that sort of, uh, I mean, you didn't have to, you could have done the three separate integrals that he originally had laid out. But we're doubling that funny little wedge one, which where the out where the edge is the is the clover or the rose, not the circle. So you're doubling the one with the with the rose or the clover. Yep. Let me uh, highlight them. Mm, we'll use this like teal one. So yeah, we're doubling this because we suspect that this area right here will be the same as this area over here. So by doubling it, we save ourselves an integral. Um, and so it's not necessary, but it does save some time. So again, in this case, we just, we excluded this one completely. We forgot about that and notice that this went from a two to a four. So we doubled that. All right, uh, excellent. Any other questions? Actually, scroll back up there one more time. Yeah, I'm realizing that I forgot to write a two here. That's what I, I was wondering if that's maybe why the person asked that question, right? That should have had a two there. It was, we were already at that point talking about the fact that we were just gonna double the other one. So there you go. Yeah, really it came from, we were multiplying by four because there are four of these equal pieces uh, and that just happened to cancel out with the one half. And that's why there's a bunch of twos there already. Right. And then when we double that, it becomes four, but notice that the other one remains a two right there. So we only double that first one because that's the one that we're kind of uh, using the symmetry with. Right, so that four now represents that first part of the integral and the third part of the integral combined together. Yep. And the second part stays as it was. Let's see, 32 times pi over 12 equals 16 pi over three. That seems like too much. So if you cancel the four from both of those, yeah, so those aren't equal. Did I make that mistake? Uh, no, uh, no, 32, no, 32 pi over 12 would be 16 pi over six. 
Yeah. Which is eight pi over three. Now that part was okay. Okay, mm and I see one in chat. One fourth square root of three over two. Isn't that the same thing? So yes, I agree with that. Um, so I think we're talking about this bit right here. And remember, there's a big old 32 on the outside of all of this, right? So I need to multiply that by um, 32. So that will cancel with the eight in the bottom. And that's where that four should come from. So that was a uh, chat question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, two problems down. Uh, one more problem to go. I've already alluded to this one a couple times, so I know you guys are excited for it. Uh, but this is not find the area of some region in common, right? So that's what we were dealing with both of the, uh, the, the first and the second one here for our less nice area problems. But here we want to find the area of the region that's inside of one of them and outside of the other. I remember there was a final exam question uh, a few semesters back or so. I remember kind of, we had a sketch somewhat like this and you had to identify right, which one was the cardioid and which one was uh, the circle. And so that would be completely reasonable, right? Spending some time and realizing that this is the inner circle here. Um, and I think there were some arrows like this. And so you had to identify there was like a box and it had R equals and then it was blank. So you had to identify that this was the two cosine theta and then the outer one here, again, R equals and then blank. And you had to identify that this was the cardioid, two plus two cosine of theta. And there's lots of ways to do this, um, to identify which one is this inner curve and which one's the outer curve. Probably my favorite uh, would just be plugging in a specific theta value, right? So if we've plugged in a theta value like theta equals zero, uh, where we're looking straight to the right, um, and we do that into both of these, right, then the r equals two plus two cosine of zero would be one, so this is gonna be four. And then if we were to plug it into the other one, we'd have r is equal to two times cosine of zero, which would be one, uh, so that's gonna be two. So we know that the one that you only take two steps out, that's gonna be the r equals two cosine theta. And the one that you take four steps out in order to hit, that's gonna be this cardioid, the two plus two cosine theta. Or maybe you've just done so many of these questions that you're now, you know, this is bread and butter that cardioids look like, uh, you know, two plus two cosine or sine or things like this. And, and circles have equations like this. So, I mean, if you have, if you've happened to do so many of these that you just have, you know, you have it memorized, that's certainly fine as well. Um, but this is kind of a quick way to see which one's going to be which. Okay, so again, find the area that's inside of the cardioid but outside of the circle. And so again, we could think about uh, maybe using some symmetry here. So instead of finding this entire thing, uh, which by the way, this would be completely fine. Uh, if we take advantage of symmetry, we can actually do this a bit faster. So I'm gonna to try to figure out the area of this now purple region that I've done here, and I'm just going to double it. And so, uh, but uh, again, this is in the less nice-ish area uh, section here. And I'd like to say that uh, still we have one of these transition points, one of these transition periods. So we can see for a while, as I have in all of these here, so we always seem to be entering in through the circle, and we seem to be exiting through the cardioid. And we do this for a long time here, enter through the circle, exit through the cardioid. But then all of a sudden, looky over here. If I was to face in this direction, which by the way is still part of this purple region, notice that I don't seem to exactly be entering in through the circle, right? In fact, if you were to plug in uh, you know, this theta value into the circle, you would actually see that you get a negative radius so actually be talking about this point back here. And notice that this is not the point that we're interested in when it comes to this purple region. So instead we've made some transition, right? And now we enter in to this region once we go past this 90 degrees or so, this seems to be the cutoff or maybe, uh, and in fact we can see for the two cosine theta, once you start plugging in values larger than 90 degrees or pi over two, cosine starts outputting negative answers, 
and there's nothing there to save it, right? That times two doesn't do anything, right? Uh, to make it positive versus negative. And so that's when we're gonna start having all of these negative answers and notice that these are not really a part of this purple region. And so once we made it past this pi over two or this 90 degrees, right? We've made some transition and now we seem to be entering in immediately from the origin. And notice here's maybe uh, another one here. So something like this. Oops, there we go. And we can even, you know, even something like this, right? Still, we're entering in through the origin and we seem to be exiting through the cardioid. So somehow this piece, uh, a little bit after this pi over two, so this piece over here, is somehow a bit different, right? And so we have to treat it differently because now the circle is no longer involved. And so really I wanna figure out the area of these two pieces more or less separately. And that's what we've been doing for all of these really is that we've been breaking them up into different pieces and trying to figure out the area of all of the pieces and then we just add those together. Um, this piece, by the way, seems to stop uh, once we actually hit this origin, right? So, so far as I go far enough over that the cardioid actually happens to be at the origin. And by the way, if you plug this in, it happens exactly at theta equals pi. And so, okay, we want to break this up. I want to figure out what is the area of this now just purple region. So this is going to be something from zero to pi over two. And then we want to figure out the area of this now very dark purple region. Actually, I highlighted it in some black there. This is going to be from pi over two to pi. And notice that we're going to have to treat these each separately, just like how we've broken up the other problems into different regions. So in this one, we seem to be entering in through the circle. So our entering is going to be through the circle two cosine of theta. That's our smaller R value. And we seem to be exiting through the cardioid. It's going to be the two plus two cosine of theta. However, in this later region that's now shaded like black, um, this is going to be entering in through the origin. And we're going to be exiting through the cardioid. And remember, uh, this is only going to be, once we find this area, we still need to double it because we need the overall area, right? We still need to account for all of this stuff down here. And so I need to multiply each one of these pieces by two, right? Each one has kind of a corresponding piece uh, below the x-axis. So we have this piece, that's why we want to double that. And we have this piece over here, that's why we want to double the purple region. So we want to actually double both of these. And so when we double it, notice that there is some canceling that happens. And we can distribute that two to each piece there. And we can distribute this two to each piece here, even though one of them is zero. And so our final setup is going to look like this, that the area is going to be the integral from zero to pi over two. Um, and why don't we go ahead and expand this out, right? So we have a binomial square. Let's go ahead and foil this out. We're going to have four. We're going to have the eight cosine theta. We're going to have the four cosine squared theta. And then here we're going to be subtracting away uh, four cosine squared theta. Ooh, that's very nice, right? It's saving us here a little bit from having to use this um, right, power reduction rule and everything. Uh, sadly, uh, in the second bit, we don't get saved. So here we're going to have pi over two to pi. And again, we're going to have to foil this out. So we're going to have four, eight cosine of theta and the four cosine squared theta. And now we'd be subtracting away zero. So just get this. Um, and at that point, this is the setup. This is the setup for the area. Now all that's left is going to be the evaluation. So let me pause here for a minute and see, are there any questions about the setup? Uh, or anything that you'd like to uh, add, Alec, while people are typing? Nope, think you got it again. All right. We'll pause for another 20 seconds, see if any questions show up. All 
Okay. Well, uh, I know it's getting to the end of class, so it's probably time. Let's uh, crack on with this one. And then if there are any questions at the end, I'm happy to come back and, and talk about any of this. So for this first one, I think we can probably just start integrating. So when I integrate four, I get four theta. When I integrate cosine, I get sine. Of course, we have uh, an eight that's along for the ride there. We need to evaluate this run from zero to pi over two. And then we need to add on this uh, second piece here from pi over two to pi and integrating each piece of these here. Uh, let's see, four goes to four theta. Um, again, this eight cosine is gonna go to eight sine. And this one's a little bit more difficult. Let me just kind of break this off to the side here. We know that four cosine squared theta, that's gonna be the same thing as uh, using the power reduction rule, we need to have the one half, and we need one plus cosine of two theta. And so if we go ahead and cancel a little bit and distribute, we're gonna have two plus two cosine of two theta. Uh, and that I'm a lot more comfortable integrating than four cosine squared. So when I see four cosine squared, uh, I'm gonna think two plus two cosine of two theta. So now I can integrate that. Of course, when I integrate the two, I get two theta. When I integrate two cosine of two theta, I get sine of two theta. And again, there's a small u substitution going on here uh, that absorbs that two that's on the outside. So double check. If you take the derivative of this, you should get back to where you started, again, because of the chain rule. All right. Now we need to go ahead and start plugging some things in. So let's see, I'm gonna get four pi over two minus zero. I'm gonna have eight sine of pi over two minus sine of zero. Uh, here I see there's a four theta and a two theta. Let me go ahead and combine these to six. And I'm gonna have pi minus pi over two. I'm gonna have the eight sine of theta. So eight and sine of pi is gonna be zero. Sine of pi over two is gonna be one. And then finally, uh, oh, well, this is going to be nice. Let's get it zero minus zero, right? Because I'm multiplying by two. It's going to be sine of two pi minus sine of pi. Uh, and so those nicely all go away. Uh, and so let's see. We have, when all is said and done, we have, what, two pi plus eight um, plus, what, six pi over two, or that's going to be the same thing as three pi's. Oops, there we go. And then we have minus eight. So the plus eight, the minus eight cancel out. And our final answer for the second time today, five pi. The first example had the answer five pi. And now here yet again, for some reason, five pi is a popular answer today. All right, so that would be the evaluation uh, for this one. Questions. Before too many people check out, I just might want to remind you again, tomorrow, uh, go on to your Zoom recitation and make sure that you've done that practice quiz in advance and you can ask some questions on that. And then don't forget Wednesday, you have to take the actual quiz. Let's see other questions coming in? Not yet. All right, well, at least uh, while maybe people are typing or whatnot, I'll uh, demo one last time in case if anyone came late. Uh, where all these things are, assuming that, uh, please don't make me two-factor authenticate. Okay, it remembers me. So yes, um, we have some review problems for quiz seven. Uh, so those are available just on that homepage there. Uh, and if you click review problems, we have, I think, I, what, like six problems or so. They uh, say exactly what sections they came from and everything. And then I just have the answers at the bottom. So. Um, you can take a look at these, try them out, and then again, you can see the answers, but during recitation, uh, you know, TAs can actually go through the full solutions, right, um, in case you don't get any of these correct. Um, and then, yeah, on Wednesday, we're going to be doing a final exam review, which that's the wrong one, this one, Wednesday and Friday, actually, but Wednesday, I've provided some questions, uh, and so, but we want to know which ones are the most interesting for you guys because we're not going to have time to do them all. I have 11 pages here worth of questions. We did three today, right? And so I, we need to know which are the ones that should actually be highlighted in the video versus which are the ones that, uh, again, I'll write up full solutions to all of these 
Um, but we won't actually talk through them in the video and then we'll leave it to, you know, on Friday's class, if someone wants to bring this up, uh, then we'd be happy to talk through them some more. Um, so, okay, those are kind of the, the, re the last administrative reminders in case if anyone came late. Uh, I think that's probably a good point. I'm going to stop the recording here.